live from the Kelly Writers House in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. It's Saturday night, and we have a great team of comi- Oh no, it's not Saturday night. In fact, it's about half as well produced as Saturday night, which is actually not bad. It's the Modpo Weekly Webcast, <laughs> and I'm your host, Al. Yikes, we have so much to talk about in the next 90 or so minutes, so much. Week five has so much in it. We have a little dip into the communist poets and their problem of wanting to pull back from meta in order to get social observation to count on urgent issues, employment, displacement, the rise of fascism, the deprivation of rights, and they wanted to make it so clear that they forgot some things about how poetry doesn't do but talks. And they, so they thought they were walking the walk when they were actually talking the talk. Wow, there's a little opinion. <laughs> anyway, and, I, and then of course the most important part of what we're doing this week are the Harlem Renaissance poets, an introduction to a few such poets and poems but mostly Modpo Plus is the place to go to find so much more. A little dip into Robert Frost and a little dip into the neo-formalists, formerly conservative poets of the 1950s. There's a lot to cover. We're not gonna, we're just gonna barely scratch the surface. Uh, we are at 610-616-3208. And if you wanna call by Skype, you can reach us. And of course, somebody's gonna call while Chris is doing some tech work here, so oh, yikes. Hang on if you're calling us and Chris doesn't answer, 610-616-3208. By Skype, it's Modpo Pen. By Twitter, it's at Modpo Pen or hashtag, I'm sorry, and hashtag Modpo Live or Mod P Olives. And Facebook, we're in the Facebook group. And the forum thread is a place to go to right in the Coursera site. All you have to do is click on discussion forums and go down to live webcasts and you will see a thread pinned there. And of course, most of you are watching us through YouTube and you can comment in the YouTube chat. So we have Lily who's gonna be reading Twitter. We have Amber Rose who's gonna be reading Facebook. We have Dave Poplar who's gonna be reading the forum thread. And we have Max and Kinar keeping up with the YouTube chat, 610-616-3208. Hello, everybody. I'm not going to greet everybody in turn. You can just wave the way Gabby just did. Hey, hello. Hi, friends. But we have a special visitor. I don't know if Zach can do quick, quick camera change, but we have a special visitor from New York. It's live. Allie Castleman. Hello, Allie. Hello. How are you? you I'm great. We are distant here, so you can, do, you can go maskless if you want. And there... Oh, Happily, no, no, okay, good. Mm -hmm. Allie Castleman <laughs> is right here in the Arts Cafe, and I have the great honor and privilege of having lunch. We're still on for lunch. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have lunch together and catch up because it's been a while since we saw each other in person. Um, so yeah, w there we are. Um, sometime in the next hour, uh, I'm gonna ask Lainey to lead a discussion that starts from a prompt from C.D. Wright and I'm really excited about that plan. I do think, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, okay with my colleagues if they think not, but the poem by Ruth Lechlitner, who was at the time she wrote the poem, a communist poet, and at the time, this is well, well, 40 years before Roe v. Wade, at a time when a woman's right to, and to terminate a pregnancy was not assured by a long stretch. And she writes a formal, formal ballad poem, a poem consisting of ballad stanzas on this topic. And without getting in too much to the graphic vocabulary of the poem, I just thought maybe this is a good time or a bad time, as it were, to discuss how this poem wears or doesn't wear in, in an age when, once again, for many women, the right to terminate a pregnancy is being eroded or deprived, and what does Lechlitner's communism have to say about that? Um, I also want to note that Dan Bergman, the Dan Bergman, who is going to visit us here, by the way, who's coming to visit in a couple of weeks here at the Writer's House. Dan Bergman, an original mod poer, 
who ended the first season of Mod Poe being able to articulate two words, which was a struggle for him. Not impossible. That, Dan Bergman, this past Sunday, was featured on CBS Sunday Morning. And it's a commentary, and it's an avatar robot voice that reads Dan's writing, or as Dan likes to call it, Dan's spelling. And um, it was a remarkable thing. And I urge you to go to your um, favorite web browsers. Anybody actually have a favorite? The one that you tolerate the most, <laughs> the web browser you tolerate the most, and search for Dan Bergman CBS Sunday morning, and you will get to see the most remarkable statement. An amazing thing. All right. So, 610-616-3208. I thought um, it might be cool to start with a poem from Mod Pope Plus. It is a poem by Yolanda Wisher. It is not a 1930s poem. Yolanda has a deep, strong connection to the first generation of Harlem Renaissance poets, but doesn't think of herself as a Harlem Renaissance poet or necessarily a direct descendant. But she writes a poem called From Imhotep's Kundalini. And its first line, and I'm uh, giving uh, the TAs a chance to get to it, so it's linked from Mod Po Plus. It's also on the Poetry Foundation site if you simply want to do a search that way. And it is a sonnet. It is a sonnet. So it really has relevance to the kind of conversations that we have in week five about the use of uh, poetic form, traditional poetic form. We also have a fabulous recording of Yolanda in, in this building, in, the, in our studio, uh, reciting this poem. And if uh, Chris, the audio meister, is uh, ready for this, I am going to press, press play. You ready for that, Chris? Okay, so here is Yolanda Wisher uh, reciting in Imhot Imhotep's Kundalini, or from it, rather. I'm going to get to the right thing. Okay, here we go. From Imhotep's Kundalini. What thoughts I have of you tonight, Du Bois, of bodies rocked and minds embalmed in bark, our blanched arrival seething with scandal's mark. Nowadays I peep you in the bean pie seller's poise. With that silhouette fit for bust or cameo, I can't always divine your debonair birth or your buku brain laboring like an earth and hallelujah's ether somehow ducking death's blow. Sure sprung from Imhotep's kundalini, stitching white reconstruction's funeral shroud, scripting Philly dirges for the crying out loud, cussing Garvey's name over martinis. Sometimes I wonder if you double agent on the page or mastermind of our ordered rage. Thank you uh, f for attending to that. Amazing, amazing reading. Um, so we're not going to do a close reading of the poem. In fact, there is one available on the Mod Pope Plus site. But what I thought I would do is throw out to some of you folks um, a question about some aspects of it. For instance, the first line, of course, cites quotes a poem that we have already talked about in Mod Poe. What is Yolanda trying to do there? Um, the second question I would have is, why is it important that this is a sonnet? It's actually a Shakespearean sonnet with the couplet at the end. And how does that square or not square with Yolanda Wisher's unbelievable adeptness at the um, demotic uh, speech, uh, particularly Philly local, Philadelphia local speech, and how does that square with the high diction that you would expect from a sonnet? So I want to ask um, Ali, Kinar, Gabby, and Amber Rose, in turn, to just make any comment you want on this poem. Remember, our goal is to encourage Modpo people who don't know this poem to read it and contemplate it. So Ali first. Hi, Ali. Hi. Um, I'm so glad we got to hear that out loud because it's so um, satisfying uh, orally. Um, and I mean, I always kind of come, I kind of start backwards with this poem uh, in the last 
Uh, and the last two lines, sometimes I wonder if you double agent on the page or mastermind of our ordered rage. Um, the whole kind of like crux or question uh, that she's posing um, with the form and content tension. That's the double there. agency, isn't it? Mm. Wow. And it's also a reference to Du Bois and the divided consciousness, double consciousness. Great start. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, Kanar, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, perhaps kind of continuing with the idea of double agency and double consciousness in relation to form. I mean, I think the the use of um, the sonnet in, in this sonnet form for this poem is sort of a, a, a double agency of sorts. Um, that's, you know, resisting essentializing the sonnet form. And, and there's no sort of easily simplified kind of pressure on the form, I wouldn't say, but but there is nonetheless sort of a retooling and usage of it that, that I think is really um, incredible. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, so this is so week five, and I hope we'll maybe broaden out to talk generally about this whole question of poets choosing to use established forms in order to do radical content. That's just not a strategy that we typically saw prior to this in the early modernists. They really wanted the form to be broken so they could talk about the broken things of their world. And now we're facing this decision by not just by the Harlem Renaissance poets, but also by the so-called communist poets to try to do other things with established forms. Very cool. Gabby and then Amber Rose. Yeah, I think I just want to <clears throat> take up making a comment about the first stanza. Um, so obviously what thoughts I have of you tonight is a reference to Ginsburg's supermarket in California, what thoughts I have of you tonight, Walt Whitman. <clears throat> and in that poem, the sort of like trans historical gesture is primarily erotic. Uh, the fantasy is that Walt Whitman, <clears throat> among others, is like moving through the suburban supermarket and like flirting with the, the cashiers and the boys that are working the store. And th what I like about this first stanza is the last line actually um nowadays i peep you in the bean pie seller's poise which feels like a kind of version of the same sim same lines from the ginsburg insofar as like oh i see you you know flirting with the checkout boy or i see you among the bananas or whatever um in this case it's not that du bois is talking to the bean so bean pie seller but he's visible in the poise of the bean pie seller. So it's almost like the bean pie seller projects Du Bois in some way. And I think like, the, so it's, the trans historical gesture is slightly different, um, seems slightly less erotic, s somewhat more historical, um, and somewhat more about kind of legacy uh, work. So great. Such a great reading of the fourth line of the verse, the first stanza, Gabby, so great. Yeah, and that is that is a pretty subtle difference. Peep you in the bean pie cellars. I mean, one assumes there's a certain proletarianism in the bean pie cellar, or maybe the bean pie cellar is is you know not in business, but is just trying to make do, right? So there's a class thing here, whereas the Ginsburg is a little less interested than perhaps he should be in the class of people. The difference between Ginsburg, who has the leisure to shop at night because he's lonely and wants company and the and the grocery boys who have to do this awful work of setting up the avocados and so forth. I think this is a, du, it's, du Bois is a more overtly political mentor and uh, than Whitman and this poem goes further politically than Ginsburg. Very cool. Amber Rose, your thought on this, and then we'll move on. 610-616-3208 is the phone. Amber Rose, hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'll contribute a thought. I, I want to say something about the use of language and this, like, really distinct silly slang. Um, I love this poem so much because um, Yolanda Wisher is modeling what she is saying or observing Du Bois to be modeling, um, which is taking these these formal structures um, and infusing them with an awareness and with the life energy of Black sociality. So 
So Du Bois was someone who um, was doing ethnographic surveys of black of black folks in a time when people were not at all interested in taking seriously um, attending to black life. Um, and Du Bois was very much about presenting black life honestly and respecting um, respecting its nuances uh, and refusing to let it be kind of a, a, a flat light, flat line way of engaging with a population of people. Um, so Yolanda Wisher is taking this really formal structure and infusing it with this other language and still kind of playing her own double agency. We see in a word like buku, like the phrase buku brain laboring like an earth. Buku is kind of playing on black slang that's just like, yeah, hella big or just like a lot of something, but also this really formal kind of French term that's spelled in a different way that means the same thing. But if you're just hearing it, you wouldn't recognize that on the page she's, she's playing with a different kind of, she's playing with multiple cultures. Um, and I also just wanted to say that I'm also kind of excited about the line uh, where she mentions Cousin Garvey's name over Martini's. That's a reference to Marcus Garvey, who had very different kind of political ideology than, than Du Bois. Du Bois, but again, she's not allowing it to be a kind of flat line where all of these um, uh, Black social theorists that were alive and engaging are automatically agreeing. In fact, we have Du Bois cussing out Marcus Garvey over Martinis and letting us know that those risks and those complexities still exist. So well said. <laughs> Thank you, Amber Rose. The refusal by Yolanda Wisher to subscribe to any kind of pure ideology does not mean she's less political. This is not an end of ideology statement. This is life, life lived politically is nuanced and, and difficult and incredibly pleasurable. <laughs> Script in Philly dirges for the crying out loud I mean, there's both horror and sadness, but also joy in crying out loud, right? Such great expression. Yeah, and I love the martinis, right? So there's high and low, fancy and not. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you all for, uh, for doing that, working on that poem. Um, I have another one I want to read into the record, but I want to see if Chris has gotten a call yet. Have you gotten a call yet, Chris? No, okay, so I'm going to make another plea. 610-616-3208. And for all you people outside the U.S. who would prefer to Skype, it's Modpo Pen. Skype is Modpo Pen. Okay, so I'm going to ask. Erica loves the poem I'm about to read. I'll give you a cue. Uh, it's in Modpo Plus TAs, and you're looking for Ann Spencer's poem, Earth, I Thank You. We always end this Week 5 podcast by just reading that poem and then letting it sit there, but I think it might be time to actually talk about it for a few minutes so um erica loves this poem so we'll start with erica we'll go erica lily jake max um and the poem is ann spencer's earth i thank you i'm going to read it aloud then i'm going to ask erica to re reread it or re-recite it so we'll have it in the record twice orally and then erica can begin ann spencer was really well-known. She's older than most of the Harlem Renaissance poets. She was well-known for having an amazing, a splendid garden and for insisting that the Harlem Renaissance had to include non-urban topics and non-urban people. Um, and she invited so many of the major figures across ideologies to her garden. And she would pre preside somewhat maternally over the over this movement um, and she really cared about the way the garden worked as a metaphor and those of you who've read Gene Toomer's Cain amazing book of mixed genres will probably see an influence from some from Ann Spencer I believe so I'll read it then Erica will read it and then Erica Lily Jake Max will just offer a comment Ann Spencer Earth I thank you. Earth, I thank you for the pleasure of your language. You've had a hard time bringing it to me from the ground, to grunt through the noun, to all the way feeling, seeing, smelling, touching, awareness. I am here. 
Okay, Erica, will you recite it and then comment in any way you like? Yeah, sure. Earth, I thank you. Earth, I thank you for the pleasure of your language. You've had a hard time bringing it to me from the ground to grunt through the noun, to all the way feeling, seeing, smelling, touching, awareness, I am here. Um, I just, I think one of the things that I love so much about this poem is the way that she's using her line breaks. Um, like it, it takes us back to Imagism and to Williams, but it also takes us forward in time. And, and it reads to me as a really radical take on what an eco poem is. My favorite moment is to grunt through the noun, which is such an interesting and amazing line. So those are my first thoughts, Al. Thank you, Erica. Lily and then Jake. Yes, um, I, uh, for some reason, when I read grunt through the noun, I often like replace noun with name. And um, I think about like, I think about this as, as the speaker putting themselves into a, um, almost like a, a, a growth, like you would see in a garden, I guess, of like starting with just a name and then through language and through some really interesting like linguistic sensory experience that's like all the way feeling, seeing, smelling, touching, um, creating and inhabiting a self and an identity throughout their lifetime that is somehow triangulated through both language and the garden and our connection to like the natural world. Nice. Thank you, Lily. Jake and then Max. Yeah, two things. I mean, just uh, obviously, I, I'm I'm also taken by the grunt through noun line, and you know, and and I'm in general just into grunting. Like grunts are great, you know. And and hey, Jake, being, can you uh, grunt for us, please? Mm, uh, how's that? <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> like I think a grunt is an expression of like pleasure, but also complaint. And and like oh it's hard and it's just messed up but it's oh, but it's also good like um, yeah it, it it's just it, it's it's catharsis of of a sort and then like uh, obviously it's beyond language but but to get to the right noun um, and and, uh, and 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 extract the grunt from it is, is very satisfying. And I think the line breaks that um, Erica referenced, they, they help create that, um, that, that sense, that extraction of pleasure, slow extraction um, from, from each, each line. And uh, one more quick thing is I, I think the last line is a biblical reference there. Like there are various biblical characters who say, like in these epic moments, Adam and a Abraham, etc. I am here, like, um, so it, it's sort of like a kind of like maybe a spiritual, um, a spiritual prayer like mm. moment that's mm. in there at the end. Mm. Nice. And if you put Erica's observation that this goes back a little bit to uh, imagism into Williams with uh, Lily's thought that is in a way eco poetry and Jake's comment that something is being painfully brought into being, that's what growth that's what natural growth is. That's what. That's why William Carlos Williams pulled over to the side of the road, you know, uh, on the way to the contagion hospital, and watches this stuff grunt its way into existence. There's always, a, you know, he's a little obsessed with birth. There's always a birth and growth, but it's necessary and it's seasonal. Um, okay, uh, Max. And before Max comments, I'm going to throw out the number. There must be something wrong with the line, or Modpo people are modest today. I know I talked to some people this morning who wanted to call, so call us, 610-616-3208. Max, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Al? Good, and you're starting to organize the people in Berlin and vicinity, it seems. Yes, yes. Uh, organizing them, yes. <laughs> There's okay. a long history of organizing people. <laughs> <laughs> Your thoughts? Um, I think this poem is a, 
a great addition to the sub theme in Modpo, or one of the many sub themes of uh, among them being work as poetry or poetry as work, which I think we get a very clear an early example of in the Grandfather Advised Me poem by Lauren Niedeker, and which I think we'll see a lot more of um, next week and also in um, week seven when we get to the Beats and the New York schools, since this is like a big preoccupation for them. And I think with this poem, the, the revision that this poem offers to, to the example of Niedeker and to also the, the Beats in New York school is that this poem sort of sees uh, it, it takes it takes poetry it takes poetry's work outside of this kind of clerical obvious like clerical working context of like being at a typewriter or like in an office or something and like and already doing like white collar work um and instead it uh it, it puts it in this like agricultural context and sort of forces us asks us to sort of rethink like what intellectual labor can be um that it doesn't necessarily need to be sitting at a desk and condensing Right, and I think that the, the additional provocation too is that she sort of flips the the work relationship with with the earth. That the earth is doing this kind of the earth is the one that's doing the work, that's doing the labor, and we you know can sort of uh, relish it, enjoy it in yeah. a way. Um, so I, th I think those are those are important uh, sort of context to and revisions of I think the theme, the sub theme that starts to emerge even more in the coming weeks. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it is it is a praise poem. Thank you, Earth, for the pleasure of your language. I'm getting language. I'm I'm able to write because of you, Earth. Thanks. Uh, there's something very terrestrial about this poetry. Um, so look, I would like. I'm gonna a minute. I'm gonna turn to Lainey, who's gonna give us a prompt and and take us through an interesting um, view of the week five poems. And each of you will get to choose one as a way of responding to the prompt. But first, let's take a look at Twitter, Facebook, f the forum thread, and the YouTube chat. Um, and I'm going to ask Jason and Dave each to respond to any of the comments that have been made in any of these various modes. So, Lily, anything in Twitter to report? Let's see. Look, our, our tweeters this morning are a lot of friendly faces. We have Ray Maxwell, Colleen Knight, Dennis Aguinaldo. And um, Tan has popped in with a photo of our team mascot, um, their dog kicks. Um, <laughs> that Tan's gonna cheer for Allie, like Allie, Allie, yeah. Allie. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Ray said that the poem has him missing his bean pie guy since the lockdown, and comments bean pie ties Ginsburg to Du Bois to the Black Arts Movement. Nice. Um, Colleen says she wants to know what the noun is in Grunt Through the Noun. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let's see, Ray put in a nice link to a slow po um, on Ann Spencer from 2015 that folks can um, find on that, that hashtag. Great. Uh, Ray is really a librarian at heart um, because he's a, and a bibliographer, so he's always giving us good links. And, and what Ray's, Lily's referring to is a, a slow poet that is an off-season, a non-symposium mode season, slow discussion in which Ann Spencer was discussed. And you can find that, anybody can find that, by going to the discussion forums and clicking on slow po. And then you have to click on the word all, A-L-L, and it's only there that you can find all the subforms. Coursera has, we hope, temporarily made subforms hard to find. But you click on the word all. I know that intuitively doesn't make sense. Why would all lead you to subforms? But it does. So do that and find that discussion. I don't know if it was a Harlem Renaissance slowpoke course or if it was particularly about Ann Spencer. Thank you, Lily. Let's go to Facebook. Amber Rose, anything happening? Uh, no, not much happening in Facebook, but recently there was a very sweet photo shared by Tom Morgan from a 2014 Chicago meetup with a very young looking Max McKenna. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> young and sprightly, sprightful. Anyway, yeah, so shout out to Tom who hopes to join us for some live sessions later in the season, but otherwise Facebook is quiet today. Thank you, Ambrose. Tom Morgan, I believe this is the Tom Morgan who is from Ohio. And during the first or second season, Tom suffered 
uh, a major heart attack, actually. And um, during his recovery, Mod Poe was his buddy. And uh, I think the next year, fully recovered, he called us. I hope this is ringing a bell for some of you oldsters. And um, I'm looking at Allie. Allie's like, I guess I'm an oldster. Uh, and Tom is still doing stuff with us. That is just, he must have driven all the way to Chicago, Max. Do you remember anything about that? I, uh, I'm looking at the photograph right now. Um, and of course, I remember Tom. Uh, yeah, he must have driven to Chicago maybe on vacation. I'm not yeah. entirely sure. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, several familiar faces in there. Uh, Matt Corey, uh, Michael, and well, a few others who I'm yeah. not. Right now, but. It's really nice. And I, as I recall, um, Tom had been in business or something. He was not a sort of poetry guy and became one through Mod Poe and his, his need to recover. So what a, I'm probably getting that story slightly wrong, but what a wonderful thing. Okay, so we're going to go to the YouTube chat to hear some stuff. And then after that, Jason and Dave will respond to anything they want from that. So uh, Max and Kinar, you guys are handling the YouTube chat. Knar first. Sure, yeah. Uh, so we have uh, had a pretty lively chat, lots of great comments. Um, maybe I'll, I'll attend to the earlier ones. So uh, Shandi, uh, Sanjeev was kind of talking about um, this age of kind of social media bubbles and, and what function, you know, protest or activism might have today. Um, and you know, mentions Joy Har Harjo and stuff and kind of is thinking through, okay, what what role do these sorts of manifestations of sort of online outrage um, amidst fake news and hate speech and all these other things, you know, how, how, is, how is this kind of functioning today and, and where does poetry sit within that? So that was kind of an interesting just sequence of, of exchanges. Great, thank you. Um, Max, anything in the YouTube chat you want to highlight yeah there were a few comments um uh related to our earlier conversation about the yolanda wisher poem uh give me a moment here i just had them oh yeah miranda jubb writes the sonnet is very much ordered rage which i thought was a, a pretty provocative yes. comment good, um good good we have ton uh saying i don't know how to describe it but the form of the of Imhotep's Kundalina sounds so fresh and so natural while being so, so distinctly a sonnet. Uh, and Sanjeev chimes in, broken form to reflect brokenness in content is one way, but when form is structured, the brokenness stands out even more in contrast. Mm -hmm. Nice, Sanjeev. Never misses a trick. So smart. Such a great thing. Um, starting with Dave and then Jason, any thoughts on anything you've heard from the Modpo people in the various forums, formats, forums? Yeah, I'm looking at the discussion forums here, and there's some great comments. Um, a couple on Boy Breaking Glass by Gwendolyn Brooks. Margaret writes, uh, would love to hear more comments about the way Boy Breaking Glass breaks down at the end. A mistake, a cliff, et cetera, et cetera. More about what the disjointed nouns are doing, saying, love to hear more about Brooks, period. And uh, Miranda writes here, too, um, and this is really interesting. I been really loving the Gwendolyn Brooks uh, poems this week. I read Boy Breaking Glass to my 13-year-old, who has some interesting thoughts about it. One thing she wondered was whether this, uh, in the poem, uh, and this is everything I have for me, referred to the poem itself. And it got me thinking, what is the relationship between the speaker of the poem and the boy, or the speaker within the poem, whose words are inverted commas? Could the poem be seen as a gift to every disaffected glassbreaker? So there's some good comments. Still I'll say, um, yeah. I want to invite you, Dave, in a second to comment on any of the comments, but I'm just going to say, Miranda Jubb, Miranda Jubb, what the heck? You are amazing. By the way, having the name Miranda Jubb, I mean, I would so want a name like that. That is like a stage name. If you, Miranda Jubb, J-U-B-B. -B. Um, and Miranda is teaching boy breaking glass to her 13-year-old and is in fact competing, because there are twins in that family, as I understand it, and she just bought the twins a snake for their birthday, and Mod Po is competing with a fucking snake. Miranda Chubb, you're a great mom, you're a great teacher, you're teaching the kids in lockdown, and you're teaching them Gwendolyn Brooks? 
Modpo rocks. Modpo lives. Miranda Jubb. Wow. Okay, I was a little enthusiastic. Miranda, you're going to call us. 215-616. Sorry, it's not 215. 610-616-3208. Miranda Jubb, why don't you do the Skype? Modpo pen. Okay. Dave, a quick thought on anything you've heard, and then Jason. One comment also in the forum is from Janice Orma, who says, Al, could you indicate in your future posts about the next webcast, your poetry selections for commentary by the assembled guests and participants? It will help a lot for us to know which poems you will be discussing so that we can be prepared for the conversation. Oh, you, you know, the, the um, way Dave but, presented that. You have a comment on that? Go ahead. I do have a comment on that. Uh, it, because it's interesting because I think uh, that is such a, a great exemplification of sort of this week's tension between formalism and the uh, <laughs> radical departure from form that we're talking about. So, I mean, I think, you know, we all experience that tension and that's a great way to, to crystallize it. Because when you said, hey, let's talk about this poem and I hadn't read that poem, I was like instantly uh, frazzled and discombobulated. Uh, so it's okay to be that way. Um, and yes. I think, you know, a lot of what Modpo is is forcing us to be that way, and and I I share that concern. I because I never understand a poem the first time I read it ever, right. Uh, right. and I really feel like I need to, to to read this. But you know, that's that's sort of a formalistic approach. So yes. I think that comment embodies what we're trying to do in a lot of ways. Yes. Well, I mean, Jan Janus J U N J A N U S goes by Jan. Jan has been great. Jan is like keeping us on our toes. Uh, your, your comments, uh, uh, offering queer readings, and also setting up bibliographies. Your teaching, really, Jan, you're, or you're helping to teach. It's great, the work you're doing. You also overestimate our ability to plan. It's, you know, Dave's, Dave's stuff about spontaneity is post facto rationalization for the fact that after 10 years, we still don't know what the fuck we're doing most of the time. And as, you know, Dave and Max and Allie and Lily can attest, way back in 2012, we didn't know what we were doing either. In fact, we never, there were never any rehearsals for any of those videos we did. They were all like, okay, what's the next poem? Start the camera. And we do seriously, Jan, pride ourselves on the improvisation, which leads us to some crazy ass fun, interesting things. On the other hand, we will try to predict next time. And I swear, Jan, we, we would like to do that. If we, only we could do it, we will. So we'll give that a try. But thank you for that comment. Jason, your thoughts on any of this? Hi, Jason. Hey, uh, How are um, you? I'm great. Um, what is that? What is that? Uh, right above your lamp, there's an object on the wall I can't really see. Is it a piece of art? Oh, it's something uh, my mom has gotten that's a... Uh, Keep calm and carry on from England. <laughs> Your mantra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I I think that um, I'm really struck by even that that line grunting, uh, the grunting grunt through the noun. Um, and thinking about the way that this poem, but the Ann Spencer poem has uh, a really organic um, kind of natural ease with English and and isn't in a in a form. And it's using standard English, um, except for the word through, uh, spelling wise, T-H-R-U. That's right. It's to grunt, but, uh, which, which echoes the U in grunt visually at least. And, um, that, that sound grunt is, but is an automata poetic, uh, word that where the word sounds like what it is pointing to mm. and but then it goes to the noun which becomes an abstract word yeah and um 
that made me think it's kind of a jump, but to the Yolanda Wisher poem and also really thinking about um, Amiri Baraka's um, something in the ways of things in town in Mabo Plus, which I think is a really great, amazing poem. Yes. Um, that Yolanda Wisher and Amiri Baraka are using uh, African American dialect speech in a way that um, is presencing it as a way, as as a language with as equal claim to being called English as any other English. Mm. I love that. And that, uh, and especially with Yolanda Wisher, the, the, like Dave said, the tension between formal and uh, breaking with form that the Wisher creates an intense tension with um, you know, script in Philly dirges for the crying out loud. And then for all this to be within a perfect sonnet is a way of really claiming uh, what one might call a dialect as mm -hmm. its own standard language. Yeah. I love that tension. I love the, what that tension produces. Um, thank you, Jason and Dave. Um, we're going to take a phone call, and then I'm going to turn to Lainey, who's got a prompt for us. It's also unrehearsed. Compl we have no idea what's going to happen, which is the cool thing. So we have someone on the phone. Who is it, Chris? Yes, uh, we have Ray Maxwell calling in today. Great. All right, bring Ray up. Hi, Ray. It's Al. Hey, Al. How are you? I'm fine. You're on fire, pal. <laughs> this might have a couple of announcements for you. Okay, please. One, we had such a great time with the um, Gertrude Stein uh, Zoom read-along last week that we talked about doing a um, Modpo lockdown open mic. Great. That we're planning for October the 16th. We haven't decided yet on the time, and we're working it out because half of our group is, is calling in from Australia. So we're trying to w figure out something that works for both. Great. But it will definitely be October the 16th. And, and, and it will Ray, be where would we find yeah. the f subsequent information about that? Do you have a thread set up? Exactly. There's a, uh, there's a discussion group called Modpo on the lockdown or something like that. You can't miss it. Okay, good. Great. And people have already started putting in their forms. It will be poetry that people have written on and about the lockdown. Got it. Fantastic. Uh, and the second thing, and I, the second thing I put in one of the um, forum groups, and I hope people check it out. There's an interesting poem that Langston Hughes wrote and hand delivered to Edwin Rolfe in Madrid during the um, Spanish Civil War. Yeah. And what what makes it even more interesting is that it's in Rolfe's collected works in the in a, uh, in, a in an introduction. But it's not in Langston Hughes' collected works because he gave the poem on the fly, and it never got it never got added to his um, to his wow. collection. So it's pretty interesting the way that all happened. Wow! And their relationship is a surprise to people who know each to to know to know that they converged yes. is a bit of a surprise. Yeah, that's very cool. yes. People 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 uh, attribute Langston Hughes to the Harlem Renaissance and overlook the fact that. He was one of the leading poets of the left yes. for 20 years. That's right. Yeah, and I think he, belong, he, he belongs equally in, in, uh, in the first part of the week, in Chapter 3, as much as he does in Chapter 4, which, uh, which says a lot about the false uh, categories that we create in order to create a canon, clearly. Hey, yeah. Ray, can I, before you hang up, can I ask you a quick question to reflect on the 10 years that you've been involved with ModPo? Um, do you recall sure. your response the very first year to turning to this week in the course uh, with uh, Claude McKay, which I know you were very interested in, uh, and uh, and you know and the uh, County Cullen? 
Do you remember your first response to all that? Uh, vaguely, I've, <laughs> I've talked a lot about Kathy Cullen and about Claude McKay, and they were interesting people in and of themselves. Yeah. Um, one, one side note, uh, while I was working as an archivist at Howard, I came across a, um, a poem that Kathy Cullen wrote to his ex-wife after mm. their divorce. Mm. Do you uh, and there's, do you... Some odd people, there's some odd people who know about this because the ex-wife was the daughter of du- of Du Bois, uh, W. B. Du Bois. Yeah, and it was an arranged it was an arranged marriage, um, but nobody told the wife about uh, County Collins' um, proclivities. Let's say, yeah, uh, and the, uh, the 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 poem didn't make it into any of his anthologies, but it's in his it's in it's in uh, Alain Locke's papers at Howard. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and the the TAs are t- uh, uh, chatting about this. It's an important piece. I'm glad you b- brought that up. You know, when I was a grad student and somebody first told me, County Cullen, uh, who was not as uh, radical as Du Bois by any means, but he was a very famous poet pretty early on and a yeah. teacher and a mentor. In fact, I think he was Langston Hughes' teacher and mentor. Am I right about that? Think I so. think that's right. Yeah, and so he, he marries Du Bois' daughter. I mean, you can't make that shit up. It's like the perfect literary history right there. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Uh, Ray, thanks for calling. As usual, thank you so much for everything that you do as a Mod Post citizen. Thank you. Thanks for being there for a call. Right. Okay, all right, Ray. That was Ray Maxwell calling from Washington, D.C. Lainey Brown, Hello. I want to hear this prompt, and we'll see. Um, you know, every, we've cleared the decks. Everybody has said at least one thing, so you mm-hmm. can call on a couple, maybe four people to respond to your prompt. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Erica, Ali, Gabby, and Amber Rose. Okay. So instead of picking one poem and kind of asking some questions about that poem, instead I have a question that, can go anywhere in the week five material. And this question has already come up in many comments today. Um, So here it is. Where does a poet stand in relation to the subject, especially in poems of protest, witness, documenting atrocities, inequity? And I wanted to frame this with the words of the poet C.D. Wright, who is in Mod Pope Plus. Um, and not really going into that project. We don't have time for that, but I shout out to take a look at, at her work. So we have an excerpt from her book, One Big Self, which bears witness to incarcerated men and women in Louisiana prisons. It's a collaboration with photographer Deborah Lester. And so she goes in as a visitor, very aware of, well, what is my position coming into a prison? And you know, what right do I have to document anything, um, the risk involved? And she says in her preface, the popular perception is that art is a part. That's one word, A-P-A-R-T. The popular perception is that art is a part. I insist that it is a part of. So my question is, what do we observe, ask, and comment about upon um, this concept of positionality, where does a poet position themselves in relation to the material? And what are the aesthetic, political, and ethical considerations involved in choosing relation to subject and also container or form? So that's a lot, but I think we could talk about any poem, um, any poem you want. This, This question seems important with all the material this week. So, Erica, are you ready to go anywhere? Um, I don't know that I have, I, I need to kind of turn my wheels a bit, but I will share that my immediate impulse is to wonder if we could look at Gwendolyn and Brooks together. Great. Um, because it strikes me that um, that she's somebody where this question is something that we, you know, that one would talk about. And I'm thinking about the poem Boy Breaking Glass because, and I think it's that poem, I need to open it. Um, 
because it's dedicated to somebody who suggested that she write about inequality as if she wasn't already doing that. And I could be wrong there. Um, yeah, so the boy breaking glass begins to Mark Crawford from whom the commission is the dedication. Um, and I just think it's such an incredible poem and, and that that extra information also raises these questions about subject and positionality and, um, you know, whether or not as readers now, you know, like how do we how do we continue to remind ourselves to not always conflate poet and speaker? Um, because I think that these questions also resonate on the part of the reader. And so I hope that my, it's, I feel like I'm giving you like a half, half, like half developed answer. Um, but this is a question that is really interesting to me and um, I need to think a little more. Yeah, fantastic. I, I feel like Boy Breaking Glass would be a really great poem to go deeper. And I just want to repeat what you said, the, the issue of how not to conflate poet and speaker. That seems that's kind of jumping out at me right now. So thank you so much. Um, Allie, where would you like to go? I was also thinking about uh, Gwendolyn Brooks um, and kind of the relationship between Boy Breaking Glass uh, and one of her poems in Mod Po Plus, um, the Chicago Picasso. Um, so, I mean, if we just take the first line of Boy Breaking Glass, I mean, you get uh, the kind of rupture in the title, um, and then whose broken window is a cry of art. Um, and if we go back over to the Chicago Picasso, which I'm not sure there's a, a kind of epigraph at the beginning, um, that seems to be about uh, the mayor of Chicago, like unveiling a Picasso statue. Yes, Is that true? Mayor Daly. Yes. Yeah. Just imagine Mayor Daly commissioned this thing from Gwendolyn Brooks. So, um, and this was written in 1967. And the first uh, line of that is, does man love art? Man visits art, but squirms. Art hurts. Art urges voyages. And she goes on from there. Um, and so, I mean, in thinking about, I think maybe the positionality in um, her positionality in the Chicago Picasso was a little bit more straightforward because um, the speaker, there, there's no character really. Um, but in order to, like she is engaging in art, of course, in writing this poem. And so by doing that, she is necessarily like squirming and like uncomfortable in the process of uh, engaging. And I also just think of um, the last stanza there, which reads, um, observe the tall cold of a flower, which is as innocent and as guilty, as meaningful and as meaningless as any other flower in the Western field, which kind of gets back to, I think, the distinction that C.D. Wright was making between like art stands apart like a fragment and art is a part. Um, the kind of like flower in that field, whichever one you choose, is both kind of um, democratically like the same, but if we decide to invest meaning in it, that's where the difference comes. Wow, amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking of this image of the field of flowers and then the individual flower and what happens and, and likening that to the process of a poet's body of work and what we might say about any poet in a certain period of their life. But then what happens when we zoom in on one poem, right? Or even if we're thinking of a cluster of poets and a movement and we're trying to define what's happening in that movement, then we look at the poets individually, something completely different happens there. Um, and Ali, I just want to repeat, so quoting from the Chicago Picasso, art hurts, art urges voyages, and then in Boy Breaking Glass we have whose broken window is a cry of art. So yeah, I definitely see that connection there. Thank you so much. Gabby. Yeah. Um 
So I think I'm actually going to also stick with Brooks, but I want to switch to Truth and specifically the Etheridge Knight response. Um, though also I just want to side note that Mozart 1935 by Stevens is like one of the great poems about this. It's in Mod Pop Plus. Um, but okay, so on Brooks, abstraction is like a dangerous thing for a protest poetics. And I don't mean dangerous negatively. Um, because I, I really like abstraction. Um, but truth is a poem which uh, <clears throat> abstracts by basically taking a image that has a cultural like uh, connotation of hope bringing the sun coming and couching it in the language of threat, right? So we don't know this thing we're dealing with, like the sun is at the door, it's like hammering, it seems threatening, it seems invasive. We don't really know this thing that we're working with. And so the whole sense of potential is like really destabilized by this poem. And then you have Etheridge Knight who's like, the sun came and it was Malcolm <laughs> X and we didn't listen. And so that's a gesture, <clears throat> sorry, I have something in my throat. That's a gesture of demetaphorizing Brooks's poem. It's saying, I'm going to take that and literalize it to make a claim. And both of them are making a kind of claim but what's interesting about the night poem is its forcefulness about saying your image is now this, right? So I think of that disagreement as a useful sort of teaching moment for us in the sense that it shows like when a sort of destabilized image <clears throat> is forcibly stabilized to do something, like what are the results next to each other? What do they do to each other? And this I think is I hope this like makes sense as an answer to your question, because I think it's a way of saying uh, a distance between the sort of like realism of the poet saying here is my situation and the sort of abstraction that actually almost always comes with any kind of like artifice practice. Wow. That's a lot. That's really amazing. It's I'm glad we're talking about the about truth and and Etheridge Knight's response, and it's very complicated, right? I feel like this this question of the conversation between teacher and student, or between two living poets, also speaking with the dead and speaking to the future, is another ingredient in how we think about the positionality shifting. Like nothing is really fixed when we keep coming back and reconsidering the poems and then who read it next and so on and so forth like it's not it makes the it makes the question of positionality even more complicated in an interesting way that i really appreciate in that it points to the relationships between poets who actually are people and are alive and are are talking to each other and and messing with each other's poetics, right? Joking or praising or criticizing. I think it's all there in the conversation. It's not, it's not one thing. So it, it just broadens and complicates the picture. So thank you. Um, Amber Rose. I'll offer two brief comments. The first thing that I want to say is also on Brooks, um, which going back to Boy Breaking Glass, I'm, I'm, I'm really um, kind of honing in on the word hour and what that does to the subject and the relation, the perceived relationship um, between the subject, the writer and us as readers. Um, so boy breaking glass um, is kind of right. The boy is the subject and um, what Gwendolyn Brooks is working against is this distance um, encounter where the boy is seen as a problem, is seen as destructive, is seen as external, is seen as a threat even. Um, and in the poem, Brooks is modeling different ways of engaging with what this boy is making. Um, but also by claiming the boy as not just hers, right? Not, it doesn't say my barbarous and little man, but our barbarous and little man, which refuses the, a distance between the speaker and subject and between the reader and subject. 
um, but rather brings us into this intimacy, this caring intimacy um, that forces us to think differently about how we um, conceptualize or categorize folks that are seen that that might be perceived as causing harm. Um, that hour brings us in um, to an intimacy and even to a kinship um, that calls for a more caring reading. Um, so I wanted to offer that on our, and very briefly, um, I think Langston Hughes, Dinner Guest Me, plays so much with position. Um, and, I, you know, I can't, we're not going to dive into a full reading of it, but just very briefly, I just want to say that the poem, in the poem, Langston Hughes is recognizing that he is supposed to be the subject, or he is supposed to be the object even of interest in this setting of the of the dinner party um, and what he does both in the poem and in the present of the gathering we might imagine is actually completely flip that he's like oh I know y'all came here and you thought this was going to be about me but actually it's about you and what you need to do so Langston Hughes is so aware of the ease with which um, folks will look to him as a black man um, to find solutions to what he describes as quote, or what is described as quote, the Negro problem. But instead he pulls himself out of the center and instead calls everyone else in the dinner party to the center to become the subject. And there's this really important um, shift in power dynamic, shift in accountability and shift in like relation that happens in that poem. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ambrose. That was so well said. And um, the two poems I was thinking about most with this question were Dinner Guest Me and Boy Breaking Glass. So it's so interesting to hear that that we have gravitated there in our discussion. And um, I really also appreciate your pointing out the hour in Boy Breaking Glass, which puts all of us inside the poem as opposed to, no, I'm separate. This is a scene. I'm looking at it. Or this is about someone else. Um, that's really powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Lainey and all. Um, f f really fantastic. The prompt comes from C.D. Wright's One Big Self, which you can find in Modpo Plus. And the reason it's there is the project of um, spending time in the state penitentiary uh, and really do bearing witness is the right phrase, documenting uh, you know, p the lives and thoughts of people who are there a long time, um, really connects with so many of the themes uh, of this week. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a quick look back at the YouTube chat, Max and Kinar, take a look now, um, and then uh, we're going to talk about the Ruth Lechlitner poem L briefly. I'm going to ask Lily, Kinar, Laney, and Max uh, to comment on that. Um, and then uh, if there's a phone call, we'll take that along the way, 610-616-3208, and then we'll do final words. So, okay, Max and Kinar, what do you see in the YouTube chat worth mentioning? Uh, there, there's a ton. Um, I flagged a few things, Kanara. I don't want to uh, preempt you, and sorry if I'm about to. <laughs> um, but there was a there was a great uh, conversation on uh, the comparison between Boy Breaking Glass and uh, William Carlos Williams' um, interest in broken glass. Margaret Stevens writes, uh, "There's something unsettling to me that the doctor, meaning Williams, can just." look and make art from what he sees and that the boy has to break the glass before in order to create. Um, and then we have a comment also from uh, Jan uh, in response to, I believe, uh, Gabby's earlier comments about abstraction and protest poetry. Um, Jan writes, in protest poetry, separation between the subject voice and the poet is like saying the silence equals death sign being carried by a protester is not what the protester is saying. She's just carrying it. Uh, and there was also a very good um, reply to that from uh, C. Ross, 
uh, saying, unless the poet is the reporter describing the sign carried by the protester. And that's in response to, to Jan's comment. Great. Thank you. Kunar? Hi. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just trying to scroll here. I lost my spot. Um, let's see. Maybe Max mentioned Janice's comment on protest I'm not sure. Max, did you cover that already? Uh, yes. I did mention the one about the protest sign. There. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. There's there's quite quite a number of, of comments. Um, Let's see. So, so one other comment maybe I would share is um, Anne is saying Knight's response to truth as demetaphorizing isn't how I thought of it before, and it also feels like witnessing a part of a deeper conversation between these two authors. Um, here's an interesting comment too from Paige. Uh, Nothing is really fixed when we keep coming back. Reminds me of the discussion on repetition from last week. It cannot ever be the same. All factors, but the words and form are different. Great. Thank you, Kinar. Thank you so much, Kinar and Max, and everybody who's participating in that conversation. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read the Lech Littner poem. I'm going to ask uh, Lily, Kinar, Laney, and Max to comment. Uh, I'll add Allie. Castleman, our special guest, to that. Anything you want. It doesn't really have to be a close reading of this poem. You might want to address, especially in the current environment of abortion rights in this country, what a poet or an artist can possibly do to respond to the seeming illogic um, of those who would deny rights or shut down rights or options. The word choice is huge here, obviously. So very curious um, to, to what your contemporary response to this poem is. Uh, OK, so it's Ruth Lechlitner, Lines for an Abortionist's Office. There is in Mod Poe often a, a disagreement about the position that Lechlitner is taking. Um, not sure we want to get into that, but just to stipulate that that's the case. Close here thine eyes, O state. These are thy guests who bring to gods with appetites grown great a votive offering. Know that they dare defy the words of law and priest. Better to let the unborn die than starve while others feast. The stricken flesh may be outraged and heal, but mind, pain sharpened, may yet learn to see thee plain, O state. Be blind, accept love's fruit, be sleek, fat, and lip-sealed. Forget that life avenging pain will speak, thrust deep the long curette. Um, why don't we start with Lily on this? Any response at all to the, either the specific question or the larger question about what a poem could possibly do against the seeming illogic of the kind of things that we're seeing. I mean, literally logic in the case of the Texas law that's in the news. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about um, this poem's relationship to the um, organizing concept, one of the organizing concepts of week five of like responses to um, formal experimentation or like um, responses to modernism. And so I, I, I often think about this strategy of using this um, religious inflected language to write this poem. Um, and, you know, today I was thinking as you were reading this second stanza, um, you know, Lech Lichtner is saying, uh, so she's saying, know that they dare defy the words of law and priest, meaning um, presumably subjects that she's writing about um, people who are seeking abortion care. But I also read that as kind of a meta moment today that I hadn't read it as before. Like, she is also doing that by saying, like, it's not that hard, you know, you're, if all that you have is, like, 
language and law and, and like these scary sounding religious words, it's really easy for me, the poet, to get in there and use those too. So that's not going to stop me. And in fact, like, look at how I'm going to end this poem. Like, I can take your addiction and your language pretty easily. So if that's all that you have, like, we're coming for you, basically. Thank you, Lily. Uh, let's go to Allie Castleman and put Max on deck. I'm also going to ask Jake to respond to this topic, too. Um, Allie C.? Yeah, this poem is particularly working for me um, right now. Um, and yeah, what Lily just mentioned, the kind of like tension between using that like religious vocabulary. Uh, but I also think the um, exclamations are just doing a ton of work in like being emphatic and not just kind of including words like avenge, pain, but also like punctuating that um, with re like kind of adding the tone to the content, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Allie. Uh, let's turn to Max uh, and then Lainey. I'm not sure what to say about the form of this poem in particular, but I am struck on this reading by the emphasis on um, the visual, a kind of visual epistemology that that there's, um, I mean, the the metaphors kind of stack up here, right? Close here thine eyes, O state, the state is blind. Um, we have uh, the pain sharpened mind, yet they yet learn to see the plainness of the state, there's a lot of emphasis on on seeing on this kind of um, um, empiricism in a way, and I think that this is educational, or, or this might be educational for a present moment, insofar as like this kind of like political epistemology of seeing, or this kind of like empiricism, has completely failed. Like we have like this very clear vision of like how of like how fucked up things are, but like um, that's not enough, uh, right? It's not enough to like have. You know, we're inundated by images of like lawmakers in Texas, like signing these bills and shit. And like, it just doesn't really like, we can see the state plain, right? I <laughs> think we all see it quite plainly. And so I wonder like if, if that's, you know, if, if that's the lesson for today is, is, or, or if this poem's lesson for the contemporary moment is something along the lines of like, we need a politics that's, that's not so much about laying plain or laying, or like laying bare the, the, the problem or something in the way that maybe was a little bit more um, politically uh, expedient or something in an earlier moment and like Littner's moment, but maybe, you know, really thinking broadly about, about form, about the forms that sort of activism can take um, and, uh, you know, what, what that would mean really just kind of getting out of this, this idea of, of demonstrating in this very visual, like visual centric way. Mm -hmm. That's, that's just my right. And of course, the, the, because it's such a strict ballad form and works, rhyme and meter works so well, the hearing seems to be prioritized over the seeing. You can see the poem, but you don't, you don't really get the as powerful a sense. And so clearly, Lechlitner is using the existing form as a Trojan horse strategy, the, basically the hymn, the churchly hymn, as a way of getting inside, as it were. Um, thank you, Max. Laney, followed by Kinar. So I'm struck in this current moment with the question, how do we make our words and actions and protests heard? Like, what's going to be most impactful? How, how do we get these messages to penetrate the ears of who they need to penetrate? And so it seems to me that the form is really brilliant in that it's, it, it's like a, the poem is the votive offering, is one way that I'm reading it. Nice. Powerful. Thank you. Kinar, followed by Jake. So I, I found myself kind of traveling back to the title and thinking about this for, and the poem sort of writing for, or on, in the sense of kind of on behalf of um, this abortionist's office. You know, the poem's sort of interceding, it's kind of abetting. Um, right of people who possess wombs to make this choice to terminate a pregnancy to not. Um, and 
I, I like the work that that kind of small element of the title is doing, um, particularly with just kind of to think about um, our contemporary moment for a second. You know, I, I saw something the other day and I don't remember the precise details, but you know, companies as, and corporations as diverse as like AT&T and Exxon are involved in lobbying efforts to kind of, you know, prevent um, the legal rights to this choice. Um, and, you know, when you have that kind of level of, I think it's fair to say maybe conspiracy even, um, uh, it's like, yeah, we need all the resources we can get, in, including, you know, those of the poem. And so we have here this poem for the office, um, which is this, you know, site of, 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 you know, pain and things, but also of choice and of sort of, um, a, a, an exercise of, of a very necessary kind of, um, embodied freedom. Um, yeah, that's great. And of course the resources at hand, including a tradition of protest poetry and the use of ballads to do so, including in the Harlem Renaissance which Ruth Lechlittner was very connected to. Okay, um, let's turn to Jake for a final comment on this, and then we're gonna do final words, and we're gonna be starting with Jason and Dave on final words. So, Jake? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still kind of um, sitting with what Lainey said just a minute ago there, but poem is a votive offering. Um, that just, like sounds like a title of a book uh, that needs to be there, uh, you know, at some point. And 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 that um, I I think I think that's a really cool take uh, on the, on this particular piece. And um, as as I was looking at it, I was trying to think, okay, well, this is the well, as you said, a hymn, kind of like a prayer, uh, a communal recitation, and and the purpose of of those things um, tend to be tends to be a little different from the purpose of poetry um, and and of course overlapping but but also but also different like a community coming together for like a, a moment or a hopefulness um, a powerlessness uh, I, I, I just like a continuity and and that's all in there and of course also complicated with like this oh state like like addressing state as one would address you know the divine uh mm -hmm. and and that that substitution there is uh like like really uncomfortable and interesting and um um yeah and 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 part of what makes makes this makes this a really cool cool poem thank you jake thanks so much all of you um so we're going to do final words we're going to start with gabby who has to sk sk skedaddle there's the word for the day you have to skedaddle um Gabby, final thoughts, then we'll go to uh, Jason after that. Gabby, what are your yeah. final thoughts? I think I want to just like um, take something from Max's comment on the Ruth Black Littner. Um, I'm simultaneously teaching a class on theories of gender and sexuality. So we, we just talked about this Texas abortion law. I think like um, one of the interesting things to learn uh, about when thinking about this issue is state power, because like, it, Leck Littner's um, poem actually tells us that abortion teaches us something about state power. Um, and one of the interesting things about the Texas law is that it attempts to disguise state power by putting the onus of reporting on the, your fellow citizens so that it's like an overwatch kind of uh, committee of your fellow citizen who will report you and then sue you and all that instead of say it be like illegal and regulated by a state but it's still all about state power. And I, the reason I'm mentioning this is that <clears throat> I think like, I think of poetry as a kind of like simulation interface where you can basically like engage sort of parts of the world, not on their own terms, but in the terms of some kind of artificial construct, which I think is like helpful and cathartic and, and, and useful for thinking. And one of the things that I think is that like, it's hard to think about states it's hard to think about institutions. It's hard to think in large scales like that. Um, but I think poetry is one site that can make that um, more accessible, more possible, and hopefully more interesting. Fantastic. Thank you, Gabby. Really appreciate that. What's the, what's the course? It's Theories of Gender and Sexuality at the University of Chicago. And you're uh, teaching it or TAing, supporting it? I'm, 
actually co-teaching it with Kristen Schultz. Nice. Great. I'm sh- I wish I were a fly on that wall, really. I'm sure you are a fabulous teacher. I know you are, actually, from all our ModPo experiences. Okay, Gabby, thank you. Skedaddle. We'll see you next week. Jason, final thought? You're muted, Jason. Thank you. Um, I'm going to say my office hours are tomorrow night at 8 p.m. And in a, and we'll talk about whatever everybody who comes wants to talk about. But I'm particularly interested in Evie Shockley, Amiri Baraka, Sean Bonney, and C.D. Wright all in Mobpo Plus. Um, and especially with C.D. Wright, thinking about what does she do poetically that gives her the ability to be, to speak about what she is witnessing. Like what, um, how does she, as an intermediary between what she is witnessing and the reader open up that circuit? And I'm thinking about uh, the image of someone holding up a silence equals death sign in public as a political act and how that brings out journalists who then reported to the public and uh, to what degree poetry has access to the public in the way in the way that say a public protest might mm. and I mean of course it's like W.H. Auden says poetry makes nothing happen, which in this course, I think we would ferociously disagree with. Oh, yes, we would. (laughs) Yes. And I would say that, um, I mean, one thing about this week is it seems to me that the fact of poetry being a place to discuss politics, current events, uh, different kinds of oppression is actually a modernist break from the past when poetry wasn't was seen as a an aesthetic realm not a political realm necessarily but thinking about um how poetry works say on the ground um in terms of activism like who who ends up reading these poems and I look I think that um, the the Langston Hughes at the dinner party poem is a, a really interesting example of how an, this activist poem an activist poem might circulate in which the audience might be those who would assume they're already, fully converted and on his side, but um, that poem causes those who might be likely readers of the poem to have to re-examine their own investments and commitments. Yeah, brilliant. That's the ultimate meta readers seeing themselves as readers. Uh, Thank you, Jason. Okay, so now we're going to do lightning rounds. I mean, you know, to to get to uh, the end of the session, we only have three minutes. So you have to do lightning round final thoughts. It doesn't have to be literally lightning, but quick, starting with Dave, followed by Amber Rose, because I want to take a minute at the end to memorialize our friend Richard Weil, who deserves a couple minutes of thinking, thought. Um, he passed recently and is a longtime Modpo guy. So let's save time for that. Uh, Dave, then Amber Rose. Um, yeah, I wanted to comment on uh, the Harlem Renaissance poems and and what I view as you know their their way of exposing some bullshit cultural facade and how uh, that uh, can be anal- analyzed or analogized to the, the way these Texas abortion laws are, are working and the distinction between like what Gabby was talking about how the, you know, there's a de jure versus de facto type of you know a, approach here where we're talking about things that have the imprimatur of law uh, 
but what this Texas abortion law is doing, it could be argued, is like trying to outsource enforcement um, in a way that just they, you can throw up your hands and say, hey, you know, the state action is not ha happening at all. It's 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 not about that um, at all. And in a way, that's sort of a disingenuous facade um, to to do what's out there. I mean, it. I have a lot of thoughts about this. We could talk about this uh, in my office hours, uh, which are tonight at 11 p.m., I think. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, I have a lot of thoughts about this, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. And I'll just also point out that one of my favorite poems is in Modpo Plus, uh, Richard Wilbur's Cottage Street, 1953. And I wish it were in the main syllabus, but uh, that's all we can talk <laughs> you about. Always, you can be counted on to advocate for that poem. It's a very interesting poem about Sylvia Plath. I love that poem. Thank you, Dave. Amber Rose, followed by Erica. Um, I very briefly will just say that we didn't really spend any time with County Cullen this week. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's worth doing. <laughs> um, the poems that, were, that we have in the main syllabus um, for County Cullen both do a lot sonically. Um, and so maybe in preparation for next week and getting into the beats and Baraka's How You Sound and thinking about sound, Jane Cortez is going to be doing a lot with sound for us. So um, uh, it, it may be interesting to take up the County Cullen, one of the Cully Cullen poems and read them out loud um, and just see what hearing it out loud, how he fits the poem into meter um, what that might reveal to you differently uh, mm. than just reading it on the page. Great suggestion, Amber Rose. Thank you so much. That's a great idea. Um, so let's go to Erica, followed by Lily. I want to use my final words to plug Modpo Plus, as a couple of other people have. I think in, um, in thinking about the question that Lainey raised, I think in Modpo Plus, it would be interesting to look at Erica Hunt's and um, Evie Shockley around the question of subject and positionality. And I think that there's an Adrian Rich poem in Modpo Plus there too. Is. And she's somebody who's really interesting um, to think about subject and positionality. And then to do a plug for next week where we get the chance to think about Ann Waldman and Jane Cortez among many others. Yes, so. week six, it's a favorite. Thank you, thank you, Erica. Lily followed by Jake. Um, observing for some reason more so this year than before how much the dynamic in this week is so much about inside versus outside and public versus private space and so I enjoyed just doing rereading you know um, doing my rereading with that lens um, and I, I don't think that that really carries over like to the beat poets, for example, I feel like we're pretty firmly outside outer space. <laughs> anyway, interesting to keep track of that. That's my only thought. Thank you, Lily. Jake, followed by Kinar. Um, maybe in, in defense of the beat slightly, Lily, uh, just to make a to make a bridge uh, between this week and next. Um, and, and also to plug another Madpo Plus poem, uh, the uh, Mary Baraka piece that's that's in this week's Madpo Plus, Something in the Way of Things in Town, which is a collaboration between him and The Roots, uh, in, in and of itself feels like a like a historical occasion, you know, just uh, uh, artists of very different generations um, creating connection and, and, and collaborating together. And it's um, it's such a cool an, an, an unusual piece, I think, um, in part for uh, Amiri Baraka himself, because, you know, to, uh, to the question of positionality that uh, Laney raised here, he takes on um, kind of almost like a prophetic future. There's something very dystopian and futuristic in that poem. And, and, and he's like, like, um, like a, a, a prophet uh, of, of a sort. So not um, someone who is right immediately in the middle of things as as he often is uh in, in in his poems but is uh kind of like um 
dystopian in, in, a, in a slightly different uh, di dimension, but also uh, really keen uh, uh, commenting on, on on the environment that he's he's observing. Such a such a terrific piece to uh, to listen to and, and and to read on the page. I, I saw for the first time uh, it actually uh, scanned scanned pages. So really cool that um, Al or whoever found uh, and scanned those pages to have them there. Probably me. Um, <laughs> Really good bridge because you get Baraka as connected to week five and you get Baraka as connected to week six. And I love, you know, you don't think of those two as going together as much as I think they do. So thank you so much. Let's go to Kinar, followed by Ali Castleman. Uh, uh, one last word I want to give is just uh, there, there was a lot of enthusiasm in the YouTube chat and some folks I think wanted to continue that conversation. So there is kind of a follow up thread um, if anyone would like to jump on there and continue wow. chatting anything from today. Yeah. Are you saying that the YouTube chatters have decided to since since this thing discontinues once we go off the air, the chat survives, but the conversation can't go on. They've created a thread. That's right. And I think Margaret Stevens created that. that Thank you, Margaret. Thread. Fantastic. It should be up. And yeah, uh, my office hours are just tomorrow at six. And i um, happy to continue a conversation today or travel to poems we didn't get a chance to visit. Thank you so much. Ali is up next with Max on deck. I think uh, O State articulates really well the like powerlessness um, that it's very easy to feel kind of in the face of the Texas law and a lot of other uh, legislation um, and I think uh, kind of in lieu of of lines for an abortionist office being able to like do anything legislatively um, thrust deep the long curette really is like a middle finger to the state um, and has a kind of like communal uh, utility for the people who the community who's meeting around that poem which I think is an important bolstering act that we could use a lot of. Well said, Allie, as always. And thank you, Allie, for making the trip down to hang out with us so in person. Happy to I mean, be here. It's so great. I mean, it doesn't, because we're in Zoom and you might as well, and you're not in the same picture, you might as well be in New York, but in fact, you are actually here at the Kelly Writers House. Makes a difference. Really happy and looking forward to continuing the conversation once we're off air. Uh, Max, followed by Lainey. Uh, I'll be hosting a European time zone meetup uh, on Saturday, October 16th at 1 p.m. Um, uh, your, uh, well, German time, which is GMT plus one. Uh, obviously, it's open to anybody. If you're on you know, a different part of the globe and you want to tune in at your time, you're welcome to. Um, if you're interested, I think a lot of people are already interested. If you're interested, you can uh, find me or just, you know, soft RSVP in the uh, in the forums in the Berlin Beyond um, meetup thread. Uh, and we'll see if my <laughs> my Zoom license can handle whatever is coming. Oh, my God. Well, I hope it's I hope you get a huge turnout. So that would be you go to study groups and meetups. That's the that's the name of the forum. And then you click in there and you look down for the Berlin group. And there <laughs> Max will be putting a Zoom link for that. And that's Saturday. You're saying Saturday. That Saturday, not a week from this Saturday. So Saturday. A week from Saturday. Okay, great. All right, Lainey Brown, and then I'm going to spend a few minutes memorializing our friend Richard Weil. Lainey? My office hours are Mondays at noon via Zoom. I've got a great, kind of a semi-regular, brilliant core showing up. Um, so please come and, and join the conversation. It's a lot of fun. And the question came up today, and I can't remember who asked it. I think it was in maybe in the YouTube chat. Well, what, you know, what can poetry do? What can poetry do? And so this came to me from, I don't know who channeled this to me, so thank you if you were the one in the universe. Poetry is a power tool. Poetry speaks through words, sound, and form, three different, I mean, there's a lot more ways, but that, that just traveled through the ether somehow. Nice. Thank you, Lainey Brown, and thanks for leading us in a great conversation with that prompt from C.D. Wright. Well, let's take a minute, friends. Uh, you know, when someone passes, when someone dies, you know, their immediate family mourns them, and they spend time thinking about it, and friends come over in person, 
But when a Mod Po regular passes away, you know, it's a dispersed community. It's worth taking a minute for Richard Weil, who was with us since almost the beginning. Um, I think those of people who've been in previous years would recognize W-E-I-L, his forum post, particularly during Slopo. Uh, he was part of pretty much everyone's uh, Mod Po life. Um, I first want to turn to Max to say a word or two about Richard, and then I want to read a statement from Sanjeev, who got to know Richard through the forum posts and never met him in person. Max? Uh, I was lucky to meet Richard in person many times. Um, I first met him probably six six maybe even more than six years ago he was a regular attendee at all of the uh meetups i held in chicago while i lived there um he uh i, I was very fascinated by his his life story he was uh when i met him he was in retirement recently in retirement or just about to retire um and clearly throwing himself into uh into all kinds of cultural activities around the city uh you know doing Modpo reconnecting with with poetry through through Modpo and other um, other sort of literary cultural venues around the city, doing lots of yoga. He was formerly a um, uh, he, he was a, formerly a trucker, uh, and then wound up running a, a trucking business. Uh, which um, I mean, I don't want to draw too bold a line, but I think it gave him a certain a certain very appreciated attitude, at least in the meetups. I think the last time I saw him, or one of the last times I saw him, which might have been. At the Tracy K. Smith reading at the uh, Harold Washington Library in Chicago in early 2019, where we were also joined by um, longtime mod poet Jordan Martin and also um, our New Yorker friends who now live in Madison, Wisconsin, Roger McClanahan and Scott Holder, who made the trip down for the reading. I think it was either at that reading, after the reading, or some maybe shortly after that, where Richard accused me or <laughs> accused mod po by way of me of our material being too lily white. Uh, and I'm, I'm not really sure what he was reading at the time. I can't quite remember. He told me that, you know, we should bring in a lot more of, of something that was way more radical or sort of edgy that he, he, he had, uh, you know, in his backpack that day. Um, and, uh, you know, then there was just, uh, there, there was, there was a, there was a kind of his attitude, you know, he, he, had no problem saying if he thought something was crap or if he thought it was no good and and that's admirable because lots of people don't don't do that <laughs> um yeah. and you know mind you he was a uh, a huge fan of wallace stevens and extremely cerebral poetry so uh uh he you know he was very open-minded to all kinds of material and always like a very good sport in discussions um and he will surely be missed he was the epi richard was the epitome of the member of the mod po community the trucker who loved stevens uh, Sanjeev wrote, I, I only got to know Richard through his Modpo forum posts, always erudite and wise, and he was always so kind to me in the forum posts in the Stephen Slopo course, and sometimes in the Facebook group. I wish I had connected with him offline on email or as a Facebook friend, like I have with so many other Modpoers over the year, but I didn't, and so I didn't, I didn't really know anything about his life, and I didn't know and everything I'm reading about him through his shared obituary is new to me, and yet still somehow as a member of the Modpo community, I'm feeling his loss. I'm ruining the missed opportunity to know Richard Moore, to exchange emails and thoughts. So it may seem strange, I didn't know him, but I will miss him. Maybe this is what Al talked about some years ago in talking about the power of loose connections or loose ties Without ever meeting in person, I feel such a connection, such a close friendship with so many mod poers. And Sanjeev goes on to talk about some of the mod pose poers that he's met along the way. All these people, he writes, I never met in real life who truly enrich my life. So later today, since my connections to Richard were via his mod po forum posts, I'm going to honor his memory by getting back to the old forum posts in the Stephen Slopo course and rereading Richard's posts, relive the memories of how he enriched my life via collaboratively reading Stevens with me and others. And then he includes, a, a, in, in this email to me, he includes uh, a copy of one of Richard's posts and what's so interesting about it, as Max said, it's very blunt and it also just cuts off 
this brilliant thing that he wrote, somehow the forms failed or he hit return, he hit send post too, much, too early. And uh, it got cut off, which Sanjeev rightly takes to be somehow in itself a memorialization that Richard is gone uh, all too soon. Thus proving, I think, people, friends, that once again, that this massive open online course over years, open, free, non-credit, need not be impersonal in the least, that it is indeed quite personal. And when we lose Richard, we lose a voice, we lose someone who cared about the community, and it's our job to, to keep it together and to continue it and welcome new people into it. For those who didn't know Richard, it's possible, not easy these days with Coursera's setup, but it's possible to, if you type in Richard Weil, W-E-I-L, you'll begin to get some of his posts. You can also go to the old Stevens forum. Next week, we will be back to talk about the Beats. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks to Ray for calling. And thanks to everybody who's setting up these meetups and fabulous uh, office hours. Thanks, as always, to Chris and Zach for doing the amazing tech. No hitches today, an amazing thing. And Ali Castleman, we love you so much. It's so great that you're here and can hang out with us. And Lainey, thanks again for everything that you do. We'll see you all later. Have fun. Read some poems. <laughs>